time change Sunday. You got to wake up earlier this morning. You got to spring forward. How many of you guys love springing forward? I mean, let's be honest. You lose some sleep, but you gain some sanity, right? Like the sun's going to be out longer. You got more time to do things. It's not like 430 and dark already. And you're like, the kids need to go to bed. I'm tired of them, right? Like, no, you take them outside, wear them out, right? Get all the energy out. It's a great time of year. But here's what I'll tell you. This time change, I told the nine o'clock, I was ready for it, okay? Like I knew, I'm gonna be getting up here, I'm gonna be preaching, I gotta be ready to go, because you guys can be tired, I can't be tired, right? So I got up this morning, I got up early, I went to Starbucks, I mean, you know, I got the venti cold brew, and I said, I don't want any ice, I don't wanna water that caffeine down, I want straight caffeine. So here's what I'll tell you, every time I'm overly caffeinated, my wife tells me there's two things that happen. Number one, I get sweaty. Welcome to the party. I sweat all the time, all right? I'm a big fella. That's just normal for me. Second thing is I talk pretty fast. So if you're taking notes, and I hope you're taking notes, get ready for your hand to hurt, all right? It's going to be like middle school again where you're just like writing in that little notebook and you can't handle it. It's going to be good, all right? So today we're in part two of a series that Pastor Lance kicked off last week called Miracles. And what we're doing is we're kind of taking this journey through Easter Sunday and we're looking at how can we expect the unexpected. We're looking at the life and ministry of Jesus. And so we're going to go all the way up to the tomb, into the resurrection. But today we're a little further back in the book of Mark. We're going to be in Mark chapter 2 if you've got a Bible with you this morning. And what we're going to do, uh, we're going to read a few verses together, pray, jump right in, pull some awesome stuff out of it. So Mark chapter 2, Starting in verse 1, Mark writes this. He says, when Jesus returned to Capernaum several days later, the news spread quickly that he was back home. Now, Capernaum, you know, Jesus wasn't born there, but this was a, a kind of home base for Jesus throughout his ministry. He would return often to rest, to just recalibrate, and then get going again. And it says in verse 2, soon the house where he was staying was so packed with visitors that there was no more room even outside the door, right? So this is one of those things where he's there. It's so busy that not only is the house packed, but they have to have like a party on the patio because there's so many people. And it says this, and continuing verse two, it says, while he was preaching God's word to them, four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. They couldn't bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, so they dug a hole through the roof above his head. Homeowner's probably not too happy, right? Then they lowered the man on his mat right down in front of Jesus. Verse five, it says, seeing their faith, the faith of the four men who are carrying their friend on the mat, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, my child, your sins are forgiven. But some of the teachers of religious law who were sitting there thought to themselves, and notice they're thinking, they're not saying it, they're just thinking. They say, what is he saying? This is, is blasphemy, only God can forgive sins. I'm gonna preface this next verse and let you know it's a little scary, okay? Because here's what it says about Jesus. It says in verse eight, Jesus knew immediately what they were thinking. Notice, not just what people have done, not just the intention of your heart, he knows your thought life, right? How many of you guys, let's just be honest, back middle school, high school, that would have been a scary thing, right? Jesus knows what you're thinking. Slightly terrifying, right? Even kids in youth group now, you just started sweating like me. It's okay, just blame it on the caffeine. He says, why do you question this in your hearts? Is it easier to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or stand up, pick up your mat, and walk? So I will prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. And the man jumped up, grabbed his mat, and walked out through the stunned onlookers. They were all amazed and praised God, exclaiming, we've never seen anything like this before. Never seen anything like this before. Because what they just witnessed was the unexpected. What just, they just witnessed was a miracle. And so if you're taking notes before we pray, I just want to share my sermon title with you, okay? I hope you're ready. It's super catchy, really intricate. You're going to hear it and go, best sermon title I've ever heard. You ready? Here we go healing. All right, let's pray. 
God, I thank you so much once again for your word. I pray that you would help us to become more like you through it. God, that this wouldn't be about me, this wouldn't be about just us, but this would be about the work you want to do inside of us and through us this morning. God, I just pray that you would give us confidence as we talk about this topic. Help us to hear clearly what you're saying to us and to get the most out of it that we can. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So yesterday, I was driving around with my family. I have my wife and two kids. We have a four-year-old son, two-year-old son. And we started going back to the gym this week, all right? So kind of a year out from COVID, my wife and I have already had it. We just thought, hey, let's put on the mask, go to the gym. So like that's why my left arm doesn't want to go totally straight today, okay? Just a little sore. I've lifted weights twice, basically a bodybuilder. If you need advice, let me know. I can help you out. And so we've been going to the gym. Well, yesterday, my wife decided to take our four-year-old. They were going to go swim at the pool. They got there a little early. So what do you do? You walk around the track, right? And so they're walking around the track. My son, my oldest son, sees these people playing basketball. He goes, I want to play basketball with daddy, which I hear that, and I'm like, let's go, right? Like, let's play some ball, even though you ain't going to be that good at it, right? But he looks at me in the car later that night, and he says, daddy, I'm better than you at basketball. (laughs) Now, if you don't know me, here's what you need to know. I'm slightly competitive, okay? Even with things I'm not good at, you're not going to know I'm not good at it until you see that I'm not good at it, right? But I'm, I'm decent at basketball. I, I played basketball growing up, middle school, high school, all that fun stuff. So I looked at him and I said, excuse me. He said, I'm better than you at basketball. He doubled down on it, right? A four-year-old, be spanked. And so I look at him and I said, no, daddy's better than you at basketball. And he says it again. Daddy, I'm better than you at basketball. So I look back and I say just like the smart aleck thing, I'm like, I'm sorry. Were you the point guard on a championship basketball team, or was that your dad? (laughs) Now, my wife is sitting next to me, okay? And you ever get that look, if you're a husband in here, you get that look from your wife, like, are you stupid? (laughs) And she looks at me with, like, this incredulous look on her face, and she goes, yeah, and how old were you when you won that championship? (laughs) I answered with confidence. I said, sixth grade. (laughs) Sixth grade. Now, think about it, sixth grade. You got middle school, high school, college, pros. I'm only two steps away from the pros at that point, all right? So I'm a, I'm a championship basketball player at the minor of the minor leagues. So I feel good about myself, right? But I looked at her, I said, sixth grade. And she's like, yeah, exactly. And I looked at her and I said the same thing. I'm sorry. Were you the point guard of a championship basketball team? <laughs> Here's what I know about my wife, okay? My wife played, tried playing basketball when she was growing up. You ever heard of fifth quarter? So fifth quarter is what you put all the kids in that can't get on the court during the game because you feel kind of bad for them. No offense if you're a fifth quarter kid. You were awesome at basketball. This is just her league, right? But they had fifth quarter. My wife sat on the bench during fifth quarter, all right? She was really bad. Really, don't turn on me now, right? It's all right. I'm still right. Man, here's what I'll tell you. 9 a.m. service, they did the same. I I literally got booed from somebody in the second row, 9 a.m. service. It's all right. I, my wife tells me all the time, she's like, you pick on me too much. And I'm like, no, I don't. And then I say, I'm sorry. Were you the point guard of a championship basketball team? Right? So what I, I just want to let you know, that's where I go to every single time now for any single argument. Like, oh, you think you're better than me? Did you championship? Right? No, you didn't, right? I was a point guard. Chubbiest point guard in the league, but we made it happen, right? Now, here's the thing about that championship. I know, like, let's be honest, I'm, I'm 35 years old. I understand that a sixth grade basketball championship, not the biggest deal in the world. But when you're in sixth grade... That championship, might as well be Michael Jordan, right? Like I was pumped, excited, because here's why. I played on the blue team, okay? This is how you know it's like really competitive. Your teams just have colors for names, right? So I was on the blue team, and the red team that we played in the championship, they were undefeated. They were bigger than us. These were like the sixth graders with facial hair, right? Like they're already mid-puberty. They're like talking about like, get that out of here, right? And they're just like going for it. And we're all the chubby little sixth graders, like, we're, we're okay, we're not that great. But, dude, when we beat them, here's what I'll tell you. Nobody expected it. Like, even our coaches, I remember my coach, Mr. Cohn. Mr. Cohn was like, I don't know what happened, right? Like, nobody expected us to win this thing. <laughs> That's how you know you're really good at basketball, right? Even your coach is like, huh? <laughs> Who knew, right? That's what winning feels like. I mean, you guys are Browns fans, so you kind of have that same feeling, right? It's all right. (laughs) My goal, I I feed off your hate, okay? Just want to let you know. But here's the thing. Whether it's basketball, anything in life, here's really what's awesome, right? 
is you learn you're not always going to get what's expected. That in life and in faith, you have to expect the unexpected. And I would say this, I know that's a, a little example talking about middle school basketball, but can we talk about our faith in Jesus for just a second? I need you to know that the expectation of God is that you would expect the unexpected, that we serve a miracle working God, a miracle, work, the God who does the impossible when it seems like nothing can happen, the God who does the last thing you think could happen, he makes it happen because we serve a miracle working God. God. I've been following Jesus now for a little over 17 years. And I was thinking this week, I thought, what if I just made like a quick list of all the things I've experienced that I would say are miraculous? You might not agree that all of these are miraculous, but I don't care. It's my list, not your list. So here's my list that just quickly came to mind in about one minute, okay? I've seen cancer healed, pretty miraculous. I've seen people in their time of need given things like homes and cars for free. Right? Now, we don't put our faith in that stuff, but we understand God takes care of our needs. I've seen God do that for people. I've seen relationships, marriages, where even the people in the marriage thought, this thing is done, it's over, there's nothing that can happen. I've seen God restore those marriages. I've seen God give people a fresh start that everybody else wrote off. Even their families thought, nothing's ever going to become of them. They don't have anything in them. You know what God said? I got my breath in them. I'm going to do something with their life. We've seen God do that. I've seen dreams that seem far-fetched come to fruition. I've seen and met people who were bound by things like alcoholism, like drug addiction, and God completely sets them free in an instant and walks along with them as they continue the path of freedom, right? We've seen God do impossible things. And here's what I'll tell you. We don't count this as miraculous all the time, but I've seen people who have spent their entire lives looking, looking and searching for a place to belong, and then they come to a church like ours and they find it. That is nothing short of miraculous. We serve a miracle working God. But let's take that big idea and let's hone it in this morning because we're not just talking about a God who does miracles. Let's get specific. We serve a God who heals. We serve a God who heals. Notice I didn't say that used to heal or maybe just maybe heals, but we serve a God who heals. Notice what Jesus says about himself. He's in the temple in Luke chapter 4, and this is kind of like when he announces his arrival, right? This is like one of the big first public declarations that he makes about himself. He says this. It says that the scroll of Isaiah the prophet was handed to him, him being Jesus, and he unrolled the scroll and found the place. Notice he, he was intentionally looking for words to describe himself. He didn't just hope that he found something good. He didn't just open up the scroll and go, there, right? No, he, he found it, and here's what it said. It says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. Jesus is saying, since I've come, things are about to change. And then notice in Luke chapter 7, just a little while later, John the Baptist, his cousin, is in prison. And John had spent his life dedicated to getting people prepared for Jesus to come. But as he's getting ready to lose his life, he starts to have some doubts. Doubts are okay for a follower of Jesus Christ, okay? He starts having some doubts. And so he gets some of his disciples and he says, hey, guys, I need you to go to Jesus. Just can you just double check with him? Can you just ask him again, like, are you the one that I've given my life for? And so John's disciples go to Jesus. They start asking him questions. And it says this in Luke 7, verse 22. It says, he told John's disciples, go back to John and tell him what you have seen and heard. Now, I love that because when he's telling them to go back and tell them what they've seen and heard, he's saying, I don't want you to tell John what you think you know about me. I don't want you to tell John what you hope is true about me. No, I want you to tell John what you've actually experienced that you've seen these things, you've heard these things, you've been present for them. Here's the things they saw and that they heard. He says, the blind see, the lame walk, those with leprosy are cured, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised to life, and just to top it all off, the good news is being preached to the poor. In other words, here's what Jesus is saying. If you want to know if Jesus is the real deal, look at what he can do. Look at what he's done. 
Lean into the testimonies of other people. Like when people last week went into the, the hot tub baptismal tank, which has to be the best baptismal tank, right? Like it's a hot tub. You're, you're feeling good afterwards, right? Muscles are limber. You're good, right? You hear their stories, though, and you go, this is what it's all about. Like God healing, restoring, changing minds, changing lives, God making people whole. And the encouraging thing about the baptism is it reminds us that still, it's not that just we serve a God who heals, but that Jesus still heals. He still takes people who are broken and makes them whole. He takes people who are emotionally broken and brings completeness to their mind. He brings completeness, a wholeness to their life, whether it's physically or spiritually. Jesus still heals people. This is why it's so important for us to really dive into verses like Hebrews 13, 8, where it says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Because I love this, an author I was reading last week, he said, Jesus never gives us an exercise in futility. He doesn't say things like, Jesus Christ is the same today, just kidding. Jesus Christ is the same today as he was yesterday, not really, he healed then, and we'll see if he can do it now. No, the claim is that Jesus is the same today as he was when he healed the man on the mat. That Jesus can do the impossible. And so here's what we're gonna do this morning, in the next 15 minutes or so, all right? Good luck. Uh, just kidding. You guys are like, huh? That's my secret way of saying you, like, we'll see if we go 15 more minutes. But that's all right. We're going to go back to Mark chapter 2. We're going to pull some truth out of it. Because here's, here's my goal for today. What I'm hoping we can accomplish as we talk about Jesus and healing is that you would walk away with a couple of things. Number one, with a confidence in the fact that Jesus can still heal whatever ails you today. But I also want you to have some confidence, some understanding of just what this looks like, what it is that Jesus does in a life. Because spoiler alert, him healing your body while it's awesome is not the most important thing. And so here we go. Back to Mark chapter 2. First thing you need to understand is this, if you're taking notes, is that Jesus will give you what you need even if it isn't what you want. Jesus will give you what you need even if it isn't what you want you want. In other words, sometimes that thing you ask for that you think you need, Jesus says, nope, got something different for you. Got something better for you. Jesus will give you what you need, even if it isn't what you want. So now let's, let's do this. Let's step into the account this morning. These four men, can we just put ourselves in their shoes for a second? These four men have a friend who is paralyzed. He cannot move, cannot walk. He relies on them for everything. And so if you're one of these four friends, think about everything you did that day to get your friend to Jesus. You got three other people, you each grabbed a corner of the mat, an end of the mat, and you carefully went to the place where Jesus was, right? You're not walking real hard, you're not jostling this guy around, you're not setting it down for a second so you can wipe the sweat off your brow. No, you're, you're carefully walking to the house where Jesus is. Then you roll up, and it's like Cracker Barrel on a Friday night at 4.30, it's packed, right? People are outside playing checkers, you can't get in if you want to. And so they show up to this house, it's slammed, and they go, well, what do we do now? They can't get in the front door. I'm guessing they probably tried a window because the logical jump is not the door is full, let's just go to the roof, right? There's usually a couple steps in between that. And so eventually they get this guy to the roof, and they decide, what are we going to do now? We're going to remodel this place. Is it ours? Nope. Do we care? Not at all. So they get up on the roof. They tear a hole in the roof. Homeowner's probably not too thrilled. They lower him carefully down, right? They lower him carefully down because, once again, you've got four corners of a mat, four people lowering this guy on in front of Jesus. You can't let down one side too fast because all of a sudden the guy on the mat just goes whoo, right down. And we know Jesus is going to heal him, but, like, why add injuries to the list, right? Like, paralyzed, good enough. We don't need broken ankles. Like, we're good. So they carefully lower Jesus down. And then imagine, once again, you're, you're one of those four, and you're on the roof looking in. And you're tired. You're sweaty, you got sweat dropping off your brow, and you look down and you see your friend laying in front of Jesus, and it says that Jesus looks up at them and he sees their faith. And then he looks down at their friend, and what they hear is this that he says, My child, your sins are forgiven. Now that sounds awesome, right? And, and we know, we've read, we know what Jesus is gonna do. You know who didn't know that? The four friends. So imagine being them where you're hoping your friend will walk. You've heard about what Jesus can do because even though we're just in Mark chapter two, we've already learned Jesus can heal people of leprosy. 
Jesus can heal people who are demon-possessed. He can heal people who have various diseases. We've already seen it just in the account that we have here. And they hear, your sins are forgiven. If I'm one of the friends, here's what I'm thinking. Cool, 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 cool. Um, glad glad that, that, that's awesome. Um, not on the map by choice. Like he can't, he can't walk, just in case you didn't know. Maybe he needs more than that. Right? Think about that. The tension of that. The disappointment of that. But here's the thing. Jesus will give you what you need, even if it's what you want. He's going to give you what you need, even if that's not what you came for. You might have, let's think about this. You might have come to church one time thinking, I'm just going to go because somebody's cute and they invited me. And then you end up starting a relationship with Jesus and the relationship with her or him doesn't work out. He gave you what you need, but it wasn't necessarily what you wanted. Because Jesus, here's the thing, his greatest miracle is not healing your body. His greatest miracle is not just healing your mind. Jesus' greatest miracle is saving you from your sins. His greatest miracle is taking you from death to life, saving you from your sins. And here's why. It does you no good to have a whole body that spends eternity in hell. It does you no good to walk up to hell one day and you just like feel the heat getting hotter and you just walk in and be like, I know it's hot in here, but bro can walk, right? It doesn't matter because you're spending eternity separated from God. What matters most, what you need is to be saved from your sins. Jesus will give you what you need even if it isn't what you want. But this is where we have to be careful because unfortunately in our culture, what we do is we tend to get the American dream confused with the will of God. And what I mean is this, I love the American dream, love it. But that's not what I'm living my life for. I'm not living my life for health, wealth, and happiness. Do I wanna be happy? Sure. Do I want health? Sure. Would I love wealth? I'll take an offering right now, all right? I'm not above that. I'll do it right, get him out, right? But God is way more concerned with his will than he is with your dream. God-given dreams are awesome, but you know what? God's not asking you to live for your dream. He's asking you to live for his will and towards his will. He wants you to follow him with everything you've got. And the hard part for us we need to realize is this. Jesus is not a genie, right? So unfortunately, a lot of people in our culture, myself included, I've done this plenty of times, is where I have this belief in me that Jesus is this being in the sky that is there to make me feel better and occasionally give me what I want. All I have to do is pull the lever, pray one time, and that must be the will of God. But let's be real. That's not how Jesus works. There's a lot of times where we want something and he says, nope, not good enough. That thing you want is gonna keep you from me, not giving it to you. That thing you think you need, that's not real. You don't really need it. Jesus isn't there to give you three wishes and go back in the bottle. He's there to walk with you for the rest of your life and into eternity. And so he's not concerned with just making your body whole, although that's important. He wants to save you from your sins. Jesus will give you what you need, even if it isn't what you want, which leads us to our second point this morning. And that's that Jesus wants to reframe your reality. Jesus wants to reframe your reality. Here's what I mean by that. In my office at home, I've got an attic, an office in it, where I work for my other job, try to get stuff done, because once again, I have a four-year-old and a two-year-old working at the kitchen table. Not a thing, right? It doesn't exist, because they're going to end up coloring all over my Bible, right? I've got stickers in some of my Bibles, guys, all right? So I go up to this attic. In my attic, there is a tube that is sitting against the wall behind my desk, and it's got a signed picture of Maurice Claret running in a touchdown the year the Buckeyes won the championship. That's an awesome picture, right? He signed it. That makes it even better. But you know what's not awesome? It's just sitting in a tube. Nobody sees it. If you walked in that room, you'd have no clue it's even there. Right? When you reframe something, you're seeing it differently. When you reframe something, you're allowing the value to be seen in it because now it's on display. Here's what Jesus wants to do. He wants to take your normal day-to-day -day life and help you see it differently. He wants to take everything you experience, everything going on in your life, whether it's your marriage, whether it's your friendships, whether it's your health, your emotional well-being, whatever, he wants to help you see it differently. He wants to reframe your reality. So here's what we have. In Mark chapter 2, verse 5, we see Jesus tell the man who's on the mat, son, child, your sins are forgiven. But once again, this place is packed, right? So it's not just Jesus, this man, and the four dudes up top on the roof that need to pay for it now. This is a room full of people, people outside looking in. 
And in that room, there are some teachers of religious law. Now, these people, think about it from their perspective. They've spent their life learning about God. They've spent their life memorizing scripture. They spent their life studying and praying, studying and praying, studying and praying. And guess what? When they get tired of studying and praying, guess what they do to mix it up? Study and pray some more. They just keep going. This is what they've done. But notice what they think when they see the very one they've prayed for actually do what they've been praying for to happen. They think to themselves and they say this in verse 6. What is he saying? This is blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. I love the way verse 8 is written in the Passion Translation. It says this. It says, Jesus supernaturally perceived their thoughts and said to them, why are you being so skeptical? Why are you being so skeptical? Now, here's what I'll tell you. When I read the Bible, it's easy for me to, like, bag on those religious guys as if they're the bad people. Here's the reality. I've been skeptical. You've been skeptical. In fact, let's do this. This is going to require some participation on your part, okay? So maybe stretch out a little bit. Don't want you to pull a muscle. Once again, championship weightlifter here. I've done it twice. Just giving you some advice, all right? How many of you have ever prayed a prayer and either God didn't answer the way you hoped or it seemed like he didn't even answer? How many of you have felt that before? Hey, keep your hand up for a second. Can you look around the room? We all have reason to be skeptical because every single one of us have felt what feels like disappointment in God. Can we be honest enough to say that? You're like, I don't know if that's safe, preacher. You're waiting for lightning to come down. Here's the thing. Like, we've all felt that before. Every single one of us has a reason to be skeptical. But when Jesus, what he wants to do, he wants to reframe our skepticism and turn it into faith. He wants us to understand that just because it didn't happen last time doesn't mean it won't happen this time. Just because it seemed you didn't get the answer you wanted a year ago doesn't mean you're not going to get the answer that's best right now. Jesus can constantly come through. He wants to reframe your reality saying, don't give up on those prayers you're praying. Keep going. We don't have to be skeptical. We can be full of faith. And here's why. There's always more happening than what we can see. There's always more happening than what we can see. So this might be annoying for people online. You might not see me for a second. But for you guys, you see right here, right? I got this box. How many of you guys agree that's a really good-looking box, right? It's symmetrical. It's pretty flat. It looks good. No stains. A little bit of tape. We're doing all right. Now let's pretend for a second that this box is the whole of the known universe. Like everything we know is there. Everything we're guessing is there. This is creation in a box, and inside that box, we've got our earth. Now, this is from the Dollar Tree, so I'll tell you, it looks more like Pangea than it does earth, but still does the trick, right? It's actually like everything smashed together except for the United States. It's all by itself and is way bigger than most places, including all of Africa. You can tell it was made in America, right? So on the earth, you've got the United States. I probably, I'm actually enjoying the fact that if you're in the back, you probably really can't even see it that well. Because here's what I want you to understand. That in the grand scheme of creation, the earth is small. In the grand scheme of earth, you and I are imperceivable dots on this planet, on this little yellow part called the United States. And so, don't we think, can we just agree for a minute that God who created everything might see more than we can see in the entirety of the universe? That maybe just maybe our perspective is incredibly limited and God, who the scriptures say that the earth is his footstool, sees more than we see. That he knows more than we know. That his perspective is limitless. There's always more happening than what we can see. And this is why it makes what Paul writes in the book of Colossians so important. Colossians chapter 1, starting in verse 15, he says this. He says that Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. So if you've ever wanted to know what God is really like, just look at Jesus. He's perfect. This is what God is. He says he's the image of the, the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything. Notice, in the heavenly realms, we can't see that, but it's there. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities. Where? In the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. 
there's always more happening than what we can see because in the grand scheme, the entirety of creation, we're pretty small. And that's not to downplay us. That's not to downplay your hurt, but that's actually to magnify the goodness of God to say, man, if God can create all this, I think he can handle the concern of somebody sitting here. I think he can heal somebody here when he created all of this. There's always more happening than what we can see. Now, the question becomes, how do we allow him to reframe our reality? Because this, what it means is we have to completely change our mind about the way we see things. We have to completely allow God to transform our mind, change our mind on the way we experience life. We can't just go day-to-day normal the way we've done. No, we have to allow God to reframe our reality, help us go from just what we can see to understanding there's always more happening than what we can see. How do we do it? We trust God. And we trust him, and we trust him, and we trust him. And when it feels like we run out of trust, guess what we do? We trust him. And we trust him, we trust him some more. I love what God says in Isaiah 55. He's he's speaking to the prophet Isaiah, and he says this. He says, my thoughts are nothing like your thoughts. Thank God, right? Like you think of how much your mind changes, how how great is it to know that God's mind about you isn't changing. He says, my thoughts are not your thoughts, and my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than yours, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. If we're going to allow Jesus to reframe our reality, we got to trust him. we got to say, you know what? This doesn't make sense to me. But I trust that you know what you're doing. I don't understand why you answered that way, but I trust that you know what you're doing. I don't understand all the reasons, but I'm trusting in the grand scheme of the entirety of creation that you know what you're doing, that there's more going on than what I can see. When we want to have God reframe our reality, when we wanted to change our minds, we have to say, you know what? I trust you. I trust you. So we see there's always more happening than what we can see. God will give you what you need, even if it isn't what you want, which takes us to our third and final part point this morning. And it's that healing happens on the mat. Healing happens on the mat. Now, I'm going to ask you for a little bit of leeway here because I understand that this is not the point of of the biblical narrative we just read, okay? The point I feel like we already gave, that Jesus will give you what you need even if it isn't what you want, that his greatest miracle is saving you from your sins. But I think that's a foundation for us to now understand healing just a little bit better, So we've thought about this from the perspective of the four friends. We've thought about this from the perspective of the religious leaders. Can we put ourselves in the shoes of the paralyzed man for just a minute? Because in this account, this is who we are. There's this man on the mat, and he's not there by choice. He's paralyzed. So he is relying on everyone else to do everything for him. You know how I'd feel if I were on the mat? Ticked off frustrated, angry, upset. I'd be asking myself things like, why is it that I'm here and my friends are there? Why is it that I've got this happening and they get to go for nice walks with their friends? Why is it that they can do everything they want and I can't? I'd be frustrated. You ever felt frustrated in life before? Like maybe there's something going on in your body even right now that you're like, I just don't get it. I just don't get it. Like, why is it? Like I serve the Lord. I do everything I'm supposed to do. I tithe, I go to church, I'm friendly. That dude's terrible. (laughs) Right? So let's be honest. We tend to compare ourselves with usually the worst person we know, which is why I can say championship bodybuilder, right? What, did you win a championship in sixth grade? I don't think so. I'd be frustrated. But here's the thing. The mat actually helps us realize a few things in life. When you feel like you are down and out, struggling and hurting. So here's three things real quick that the mat helps us understand. The first thing is this, is that the mat is where we embrace humility. The mat, when you feel down and out, you feel like you have nowhere else to go, this is where we embrace humility. No paralyzed person laying on a mat looks up to his friends and say, you know what, don't worry, fellas. I got this, let me go to the roof. Nobody gets up to the roof and goes, okay, I know it's not working out, but I'm gonna tear through the roof now myself. No, all he's thinking is, dear God, I hope it's a flat roof so I don't roll off, right? Because the mat 
is where you embrace humility. The mat is where you understand that you can no longer say things like, I got this. Because at the end of the day, friends, that's just pride. And for so many of us, what we do is when we have something in our life that only God can fix, we try to convince ourselves that we can fix it. And the mat is a gift because it's a reminder that no matter how bad things are, if I'm humble enough, God can work with me. In fact, it says this in James 4, 6. It says that God opposes the proud. In other words, sets himself against our pride. Like actively combats it and fights against it. He opposes the proud, but gives grace. Another translation says, shows favor to the humble. So our pride, God opposes us and our humility, God says, let's go. He gives grace, he shows favor to the humble. Where do you need to inject some humility? into your pursuit of God. Second thing we see about the mat is this, is that the mat is where we realize we need each other. The mat is where we realize we need each other. Once again, you can't say, I got this. You need those four friends that are gonna carry the mat. I love where it says that Jesus saw their faith and then said to the man, child, your sins are forgiven. Notice, it wasn't the man's faith on the mat. You might feel like, I don't know if I have enough faith right now. You don't have to. Are you running with faith-filled people? Do you have people in your life that will pray for you when you can't pray for yourself? Do you have people in your life who are gonna support you when you feel like you have nothing to give? Because that's the test of a friendship, right? It's not when it's mutually beneficial. Friendship is really tested when I don't have anything to give you, and yet you're here anyways. It's where we realize we need each other. And here's what I'll tell you. There are a lot of things that I think the past year have shown us that are great things. There were some gifts in the past year for some of us here. But one of the things that came out of this past year that's scary to me is there are many of us who already felt like we could kind of do this thing on our own who are just further entrenched in that now. That you figured out, man, I, I can have groceries delivered. I can watch church online. I don't have to leave my house. I could wear a button-up shirt and sweatpants and nobody knows. Here's why that's scary. Because we need each other. And hear me, once again, if you're at home for your health, that's awesome. If you're home out of habit, Time for a new habit. We need each other. It is in our DNA to need other people. We can never think for one second that we can do life on our own. So who do you need to be praying for? Who do you need around you to be praying for you? This might be a great time to evaluate who you're running with. Third and final thing we see about the mat is the mat, I love this, becomes the story you tell. The mat, you at your lowest point. The mat, the time where you feel like you have nothing to give. The mat, the time you wanna push through becomes a story you tell. The thing in your life right now that you just wish was over, can I tell you? Oftentimes, Jesus doesn't wanna save you from it, he wants to save you through it. We wanna run away and he says, nope, I want you to stay a little longer. Because I got something to teach you. See, I love, we get to the end of these verses here, verse 11. Jesus has looked at the man now. He says, what's harder? To say, child, your sins are forgiven? Or to say, stand up, pick up your mat and walk? And then he looks at the man and he says, stand up, pick up your mat and go home. I love that Jesus doesn't let him leave his mat behind. He doesn't tell him, stand up, dust yourself off and get out of here. He says, no, stand up, pick up your mat and go home. Here's why I love that. This man is whole, he's complete, he's good. Could you imagine with me like a couple years down the road, dude's making brand new friends that don't really know his story. They come over his house and he's cooking dinner, he's walking around, he might even be dancing, listening to some music, who knows, right? And his friend looks at him and says, hey, can, can I ask you, what is up with that dirty, disgusting old mat sitting over there. And I love the idea that this man could then look at his friends and say, man, have I got a story to tell you. And you ever think about the people in your life that they're looking at your life now and they're going, I just don't get it. Like, why don't you do what you used to do? Why don't you respond the way that other people respond? Why are you happy? Let me tell you a story. And this is the chance we have to say, look what God, look at what God can do. 
Look at what God can do through somebody who's humble. Look at what God can do through somebody who's running with the right people. Look at what God can do when I don't try to run away from my problems, but I lean into them and say, okay, God, you are using this mess to set up a miracle. Here's what I believe, that everything God does in you is not just for you, but it's for other people. That God's gonna use the deepest, darkest time of your life. You're gonna help somebody with it because that's what God does. So I'm gonna ask you if you will, whether you're in person or online, would you just close your eyes where you are for just a moment? I wanna tell you, this morning, whatever it is you got going on, maybe you need physical healing in your body. Maybe mentally, you're just exhausted. Maybe spiritually, you just know, man, there's a gap and I'm, I'm going through it. Today's the day to get on your mat. Today's the day to acknowledge there's a problem. Don't act like you got it. Don't act like it's not a thing. But I have a mat that needs to be laid on. In this room and online, here's, here's the big thing for me. The heart of this account, once again, is not just physically healing somebody's body, but it's saving someone's soul. Maybe today you're sitting in here, you're watching online, you're saying, man, that just, that resonated with me. And where you are now, you would just be honest enough to say, I need to start a relationship with Jesus. I need to make him Lord of my life. That just means that he's in charge. He gets to call the shots. And you would just say, today's the day. Nobody's looking around except for me. I want to start a relationship with Jesus. Would you just raise your hand online? There's going to be a little a moment where you can respond to. But I just want to start a relationship with Jesus. Just right where you are. Just take a moment acknowledge it. For the rest of us in here, I can't encourage you enough. Let's be specific with God for just a moment as we pray. To say, God, this is what's going on. Let's acknowledge it and get on the mat this morning. Jesus, I thank you once again for every single person in here. God, I pray that you would help us to be honest with our struggle, honest with what we're processing, honest with what we're going through. Jesus, help every single one of us to trust you more than we trust ourselves. Help us to allow you to reframe our reality, to see things differently. And ultimately, God, help us to be people who don't run away from the struggles in life, but we understand that our struggle is setting us up for a story and that you're worth following. Jesus, once again, we love you, we thank you, and we affirm our trust in you.